Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that won't nick or snag your nuts. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have Ellie next door. She is an asexual sex worker. And if you're scratching your head a little bit going like, wait, how is that? And what does that even mean? Ellie is here to tell us. So Ellie, first of all, how are you doing today? I am so good. How are you doing today? I am great. I am great. So yeah, let's get right into it. Like, I guess let's start off by, can you kind of tell us exactly what being asexual means? Yeah. So obviously everybody experiences their sexual their sexuality differently. But for me, uh, I find that while I definitely have attraction to certain people, like I can, you know, look at somebody and see that they're really attractive, see that they're really hot. I just for me, that attraction just doesn't extend into thinking about having sex with them or thinking about them naked or thinking about them in a sexual way. So I, it's a, it's one of the things that's a little bit difficult to explain, of course, but how I try to explain it is when I look at, you know, Michelangelo's David, that big statue, I can look at the human form and I can see like, this is beautiful and it's muscular and, and it is amazing. But at the same time, I don't, think about having sex with David. I don't think about him coming down from his pedestal and having sex with me. So for me, when I experience attraction to people, it's more of a romantic attraction, a desire to, you know, be, you know, physically intimate in a non-sexual way, like, you know, hugging, kissing, touching, having a romantic relationship with them where I have, you know, a real connection with them, a friendship. There's different ways that people can experience attraction. And sexuality and sexual attraction is just a portion of that. It's just not something I personally have a lot of experience with. So when did you, I guess, realize that you were asexual? And how did you come to that realization? Well, when I was a little bit younger, I was very active on like, you know, uh, LGBT social justice warrior kind of <laughs> kind of spaces online. And so I was really exposed really early to a lot of really specific language about how to describe your sexuality and the way that you feel and these really specific, uh, you know, genders and sexualities that some people might think are not valid or m- might not agree with. But I think they're really good for describing how people feel inside with within themselves. And so through that, I found the asexual community and it really was listening to other, reading other people's experiences, reading people's accounts of like when they realized they were asexual, when they realized something was different about them as their other friends are. And that's when it clicked for me was I realized that I was like, I feel like there's something a little bit different that I'm not quite getting. It wasn't up until a couple months ago that I really you know, I was in quarantine and I was home a lot and I was just scrolling on my phone and I kind of got back into those asexual spaces, you know, on Reddit and on Twitter. And I just had the same experience of reading people's stories and just thinking to myself that these made so much sense and that this was much more relatable than anything that I've ever seen in media or heard described to me or just the way that other people seem to be. Does that make Mm. sense? Yeah, it does. I'm just, so then, you know, when, when we're growing up and we're teenagers, we have like hormones coursing through our body and we start to discover our own sexuality. So was that part of your story? Like, did you still, like, do you still masturbate? Like, do you get turned on, but just not by other people or like that is not a component at all? Yeah. So, I mean, asexual doesn't mean that I don't. So libido and sexual attraction are different things. Libido is how much your body and your monkey brain just want you to have sex, whereas sexual attraction is, you know, about that specific person that you're attracted to. Uh, so some asexual people have libidos. It's obviously, it's always different for everybody. But uh, for me, I definitely sometimes can get horny. Uh, I'm on medication that kind of suppresses that right now. So just as a side effect. So I, it's not really relevant for me right now. I don't really masturbate outside of um, 
you know, for work, <laughs> which is always really fun. And it does feel good. The pipes all work. System's all there. Uh, mm-hmm. I just don't feel a really strong desire to when I look at somebody, like when I look at somebody at the mall or when I, you know, I'm out in public or I see a picture of somebody on Instagram. I literally just never have the thought that I would want to have sex with them. I might mm-hmm. think, oh, I want to make out with that person or I want to kiss that person or I want to, I don't know, go to a museum with that person. But it just just sex is never as part of it. So can I, can I ask you then, when did you lose your virginity and, and how was that for you? Well, I was, I was 18. I had just about to go to college and <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I've always had a pretty, I'm pretty utilitarian. I look at things really not black and white, but I look at things pretty um, critically. And so I, I remember having the thought that who I lost my virginity to was kind of important because I would kind of think about it a little bit. But after that, it wasn't super important because, you know, you grow up and you just assume that how you feel is how everybody else feels. I just assumed that what I was feeling was how people experienced their their regular sexual attraction to other people. So you don't know anything's wrong or different. And I wasn't opposed to having sex with people. The idea isn't gross or isn't off-putting because I don't really, it doesn't gross me out. I just am not crazy, crazy interested in it. Mm. So was it kind of like a a notch that you needed on your belt, like a thing that you did check off? I mean, honestly, for me, that's what losing my virginity was for me. I was like, well, I better lose my virginity because all my friends have done it and that's what I'm like supposed to do. Yeah. Um, so was absolutely. it kind of like that for you? There, there's absolutely a level of that. Um, I think, so for me, what I've realized as I've gotten older, uh, sex, like sex is for me just another dimension of how I can express my love and affection for somebody. You know, you can express, you know, there's all sorts of different love languages and there's different ways that you can, t- you know, express to somebody how much they mean to you. And one of those ways is sucking their dick (laughs) some people (laughs) love it's that's a great love language is blowjobs like you know if you're really good friends with somebody and you're not particularly opposed to giving them a blowjob they might love it you know like (laughs) it's just another way that you can connect with people and that you can you know experience your body and experience life it's so I'm I'm a little bit different than other sexual people other sexual people don't you know, you don't seek out sex because you're you're not thinking about people. Mm -hmm. But for me, if the opportunity is provided, I don't generally always turn it down because Mm -hmm. I'm happy to make other people happy and I'm happy to please people and make them feel really good. It makes me feel good to make them feel good. I love it. I love being good at giving a (laughs) blowjob. Okay. So it's kind of like, it's, it's like a service that you do to express your affection for someone. It's like giving someone a massage, right? Like generally giving someone a massage doesn't turn you on. It doesn't like feel amazing to have like your fingers on someone's shoulders, but they feel really good. And so their response is the reward for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And of course you can have really nice central massages where you, you know, have nice lotion and you turn the lights down. And I mean, really how, how far off is that from putting your dick in someone's vagina or, or, you know, putting your dick or whatever genitals are going wherever they are. Uh, you know, how much of a leap is it? Like I didn't grow up viewing my body as inherently sexual or shameful or that naked people were something to be like, you know, giggled and shied away from, you know, I went to art museums and it was never about look at the naked lady in the painting. You know, it was, everyone's got a butt, everyone's got nipples. Everyone, everyone is a, is a person. It's not about, oh, my, my breasts are scandalous and scary and will be sinful so I have to be really careful of who's seeing them everybody's got some people got boobs like all right awesome it's not it's just another part of your body just like sex is another way that you can experience touch and affection and love for somebody that's so interesting so you you grew up without it sounds like without like a sense of shame around sexuality or around your body So I wonder how many other people are maybe just asexual by nature, but it's buried under like 
having been taught as a child that sex is shameful, that sex is dirty, that sex is wrong. And so for them, you know, their lack of desire to have sex seems to be centered around some kind of like religious teachings or, you know, the idea that it's a bad thing. But for you, it seems like, you know, you, you're open you were raised open to the idea, but then you've just come to find that just you yourself are not particularly interested in such a thing, but it wasn't something that was like denied or shamed to you when you were younger. Does that sound right? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're certainly not walking around naked with each other. We're not, we're not big, uh, big talkers with each other all the time. So we didn't necessarily like talk about sex, but when Mm -hmm. it comes to just like the human body and like, you know, and just accepting that people look different and people, you know, have different types of bodies and that your body is natural and normal and you shouldn't feel ashamed about it. Uh, I think just for me translated and developed into a part of my sexuality and part of my, the way that I interact with sex, I don't come at it from an angle of like, if I, this guy sees my boobs, it's like an NFT. Like this guy is the one dude who's ever going to see him. You know, like, like my body doesn't have less value based on how many people have seen it. Mm-hmm. If that were true, celebrities' bodies would be worth this. Like that, that doesn't make any sense. If 10,000 people have seen a picture of my nipples, my nipples aren't somehow less beautiful and physically there and awesome for everybody else that's looking at them. So like who cares maybe in, a, maybe in a way they're even more so because you know they're out there in the public to be revered and enjoyed and appreciated you know i mean you could say the same thing about works of art like how is a work of art a work of art if no one sees it you know exactly like yeah like we would have paintings and like uh art prints of like you know topless women just because in the period that the, the piece of art came out that was just the style it's not mm-hmm. about her sexual breasts and oh my god we can't let our children see this it's just okay that's what people look like you know it's not something that you have to and like that sucks that people do feel that way and to go back to your point I kind of brushed over I'm sorry about people that are probably asexual don't even realize it um I've read some sort of statistic seems to be about 1% of people are probably asexual on some level. But what I find really, really interesting is that demisexuality, which is uh, part of the spectrum of asexuality, uh, is, I think, more common than people think it is. Demisexuality, to be for everybody, uh, is when you only form sexual attraction to somebody that you already have a pre-existing relationship with. So that means like you don't ever have sexual desire or, or like sexual attraction to strangers. But if you have a really close friendship or, you know, like coworker relationship with somebody that develops over time, then those feelings of sexual attraction build. And I think oh, I and I see like comments online of people saying that that's how they feel and people being like, that's not being asexual. I feel like that. And it's yes, it is. <laughs> It's just so interesting, this spectrum of human sexuality, and that's one of the really fascinating things about doing this podcast is I get to talk to so many people, different people who have different ways of defining their sexuality. Um, So now being asexual, did that make dating hard for you? Is it hard for you now? Like how is your relationship maybe different? Yeah. I mean, so I've never had a problem dating. Uh, I feel like I have a decent enough personality to get through a couple of dates and I don't look too terrible. So frankly, dating has always been really easy. Um, a lot of, you know, I've, a lot of the times, you know, I would experience a certain just other forms of attraction to somebody and just, you know, be in relationship with them because, you know, if you don't know that how you're feeling is different from everybody else or you don't think about it, I just kind of was just going with the idea that, Oh, well, I was dating them and I liked, you know, making out with them and I liked being around them. So like we said, like sex is just part of it. But I, I'm, you know, I realized later on, like, oh no, people are experiencing this just in a different way than I am. Does so, that make sense? W- I think so. So sorry, I just want, I'm going to get kind of specific here because I just want to make course. sure that like I understand. So when you're making out with somebody, when you're engaging in foreplay, like, do you get wet or do you not because you're not turned on? 
or are you turned on? See, that's tricky. I, I genuinely think I have a little bit of like a medical problem going on because I have a lot of like vaginal pain when I do penetration. So I don't do any okay. pe- penetration on my work. Um, uh-huh. I just have a lot of pain. So that, that doesn't help. If I could throw right. a bad dragon dildos up there all day, then I would. Right. I, just, I just can't. <laughs> but yeah. uh, so there's a little bit where I think that I probably have a little bit of a physical issue, but on the mm-hmm. other hand, it kind of depends, you know, most, you know, I'm, I'm pretty young. I'm 21. So I've dated, you know, college age boys and they're not exactly, uh, you know, sons of seduction. They're not, <laughs> <laughs> we're not exactly talking about like <gasps> people with prowess. So they're not I'm, like a real Casanova. No, like I, I, you know, I really enjoyed, you know, relationships with them or the one night stands that I had or, or whatever else. Like, I'm sure they were very nice, but they weren't exactly all, uh, you know, Hugh Hefner's. So mm-hmm. uh, there's probably a level of that. The person that I went now is amazing. I love him so much. He's the best person I've ever been with. And um, like I said, you know, sex is just another way that I express my love and affection for him. Um, and so, yeah, like sometimes I get wet. It's kind of like a monkey brain thing just mm. like getting wet like I, I don't want to speak for you but I'm sure sometimes on some sets and some occasions you're doing a shoot and maybe you get a little wet it's you know like you're doing work but something in your monkey brain is like all right okay I don't mm-hmm. hate this like there's you know you're you can't explain yeah, okay I, 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 th- I see what you mean like maybe I get like a little twitch where I'm like oh my vagina finds that kind of interesting but I have no desire to jump into the scene and I don't want to have sex with those performers afterwards I don't want to like you know go home with any of them like I haven't developed a sexual attraction for that person the scenario was just something that was kind of hot and that has happened to me literally like three times in the 22 years that I've been doing this people always ask me if I get turned on by my work and it's like we kind of talked about this a little bit before we started the podcast, but like yeah. pretty much no, because I'm working. Yeah, so. of course. No. Uh, yeah. That's actually, I think, a great way to explain it. You suddenly, it's only happened to you a couple of times, but for me, that's kind of most of the time. It's not about the specific person that I'm with necessarily. Usually it's about like the situation. So like if I watch porn, I don't have like specific porn stars that I watch. Speci- I don't have like a... It, a specific preference for a physical body type it's really more about the concept and the scene and you know like the the fantasy it's I don't really care what the people doing it look like for the most part mm. it's not about how big the guy in the porn stick is or how or what he looks like it's just about this particular scene or this particular you know whatever it is that uh that goes on mm. is that I think I think uh I hope any performers listening maybe kind of understand this a little bit where you're not opposed to having sex with the person you're going to do a shoot with, but you're also not like r- raring to go. You're not like, oh, like if we, I would do this for free. <laughs> I guess therein lies the, the real question, right? Or the real answer, I should say. If you do this for free, then- I was the uh, sucker doing it for free. <laughs> I was a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> but so actually that's a great segue so we're going to take a quick commercial break but when we come back we're going to talk about what it's like to be a sex worker who is asexual how does that work what is the kind of sex work that ellie does so uh stick around guys we'll be right back got bush you definitely do if you haven't started using the products from my sponsor manscaped since i've started working with manscaped they've really expanded on their product line it's incredible So of course we've got the Lawnmower 3.0, their revolutionary electric body trimmer, which is not only cordless, but it's also waterproof. So you can actually use it in the shower. They also have the Crop Preserver and the Crop Reviver, a ball deodorant and a ball toner to keep your balls smelling nice and fresh. And if you get their perfect package, you will not only get the aforementioned ball toner and ball deodorant, but you will also get, of course, the electric trimmer, a shed travel bag, and their boxer briefs, which are the most comfortable boxer briefs you will ever wear. You can get all of this for 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU. That's 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU. 
Hey guys, welcome back. So Ellie, uh, we've, you know, talked about what being asexual is. You've kind of explained that for all of us. So how does somebody who's asexual end up in sex work? Well, I mean, I imagine it's probably similar to every other, uh, you know, queer person who does end up in sex work or any person ends up, who ends up in sex work. You know, like we kind of talked about before, it's not necessarily about who you're attracted to. You know, if you're, you know, doing full service sex work, you're not always basing your clients off of necessarily who you're physically attracted to. So for me, who I'm physically attracted to is basically just as irrelevant as it is for almost every other sex worker you know that we hear all sorts of stories about sex workers who are lesbians or you know are bisexual or are in relationships or whatever else it is and it's it's yeah like it's it, sex work is work so it's for me it's not about who i personally want to have sex with yeah that makes a lot of sense and then you do a lot of like camming and and, and i think you mentioned the phone sex as well so you're actually not having sex with somebody else in those environments, right? That's more of you interacting with your audience, correct? Yep. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I say this and I, you know, like the hierarchy where, you know, some people think that some types of sex work are better than others. I'm not above any kind of sex work, but for me, um, I've never crossed the bridge of, I've never done any kind of penetration in my mouth, in my pussy or in my vagina. I'm so sorry. <laughs> in my mouth, in my pussy, or in my ass. Um, it's just not a bridge I've crossed yet. So I've, again, like it's very irrelevant who I want to have sex with because I don't have sex with people in my work. Maybe right. that's a bridge yeah. I would cross later. Who knows? But for right now, that's just not what I've done yet. That makes a lot of sense. So, so what does your work generally consist of? Yeah. Well, for about a year and a half, I was camming full time, five days a week on Chatterbait. Uh, and I was very strict about my schedule. I was really good. But, uh, you know, December with, you know, the 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 whole world going to uh, to a disaster. It, yeah, to <laughs> shit. It was, uh, you know, things kind of fell off for a little bit. So I've been on a little bit of a hiatus. I'm sure I'll go back to camping at some point because I really, really did love it. Uh, but I do a lot of um, phone sex on Night Flirt. I have my OnlyFans, of course. Uh, and I also help other uh, sex workers or early anybody else who wants me to uh, help other sex work workers uh, promote themselves on Reddit, which is really, really, really difficult to do because Reddit is this like very specific hell site where it hates sex workers and it hates women and it hates promotion. So you have to navigate it very slyly. So I do a lot of that. that that is it's so funny. That is so true. I remember when my brother, who's um, actually was a computer science major and is like a total tech nerd, first told me about Reddit. And he was like, you know, it's amazing. It's like that what they call themselves the front page of the internet. Um, yeah. It's a great place to promote yourself. Yet they hate people who promote they themselves. So yep. you have to go on there and promote yourself in a way that doesn't appear like you're actually promoting yourself. It's very tricky. Yes. It's very tricky because pe it's true. People hate it. Like if you, like if you post, uh, like a, a post with, I made this and my business is this in the title, you are not going to get upvotes. But if you say I made this, and then if you have your friend go and comment, oh my God, I love this. Then you can comment and you can say, this is my store, but someone has to ask. You can't go in. It's, it's like so archaic <laughs> and very complicated. There's a whole science to it. I have like an algorithm that I use. It's very complex, <laughs> but it gets uh, it gets really intense, and but they hate women, they hate sex workers, and uh, there's just so many of us on Reddit at this point that you really have to be very strategic, or else you just mm. fall into this other this sea of other girls and OnlyFans that the general population of Reddit kind of resents. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, with the explosion of OnlyFans and everybody getting on that platform and everybody promoting yeah. it. I mean, even my Twitter feed is like, oh my fucking God, like another OnlyFans promo. You it's, know what I mean? It's like it's all it is is OnlyFans promotions. And I feel bad because it's a lot of these girls that are posting and they're so they're like uh, there's like a whole kind of like I no, at the same time, I don't even blame a lot of Redditors for being like frustrated with with OnlyFans girls because a lot of them will post like the same picture in 20 different subreddits in a single day and yeah it's fucking annoying like I, I don't like it when I see it it makes me turned off or people will be promoting in like OnlyFans subreddits this, this is advice if you ever 
one of our only fan, you know, on Reddit, um, masterclass over here, never post in those like only fans specific ones with the title because it's an echo chamber of you and 10,000 other girls and like t- five people that are going to actually spend money. Mm. No one goes on Reddit with the intention of buying porn. You have to, you have to make yourself like a recurring character on a subreddit. Mm. And then if you get a following and then that following builds you, it's, I can go into it. I won't. So basically you have to like go in there and just kind of be a part of the community and get people to like you. And then if they like you, then they might support you financially, but you can't just go in there and just drop promotional um, photos and links because they're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I see that. Exactly. You have to make like, like I say, you know, it's, you can see 10 million pairs of boobs on the internet for free, but if you want to see my boobs, they're going to be behind the paywall. And Mm -hmm. the difference is that you want to see my boobs. Otherwise, there's no reason for you to to purchase something from me. You know, I I get, I understand that not everybody wants to pay for porn all the time. I'm not going to get in a soapbox and like admonish everybody. Like, whatever, it's not none of my business. But at the same time, you know, obviously I don't want my content stolen and it's shitty when you know, paywall content gets stolen. But if you want someone to purchase or something from you, you have to make them want something special in it. Then you have to, you have to be the special thing. You have to create a personality for yourself and make yourself have hobbies and interests and pets and things going on in your life. Because otherwise you just unfortunately end up in this sea of other people that don't have a really distinct personality or really distinct voice that makes them stand out. Right. And you have a very specific niche, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. My, my primary niche, especially when I was camming, um, is that I am all natural or a naturalist to some people say, uh, where I don't shave any of my body hair. So I have my, my, <laughs> I don't know if you can see it, but you got my armpit, whatever. Who okay. Cares? I can see. I, whatever. Who cares? Um, yeah, my, my, you know, my pussy and my legs and all, all that. Uh, and that's a really specific audience and the people that love it, love it. And the people that don't, that's totally fine. I get it. Yeah. You're, you're right. There is a big divide there. There's definitely people who, who don't like it, but there's definitely people who like fucking love it, like yeah. are crazy about it. Yeah. And it's really clever of you to be able to pick up on that niche because you're right, you know, in a sea of women who are all trying to promote themselves. I mean, there's so many pairs of boobs, as you said, that you can see on the internet. Having a specific niche like that, I would imagine probably really pays off. Yeah, absolutely. That was from day one. I had, cause I had people, cause I, I don't shave normally. It's itchy and a pain in the ass. So I don't do it. It's such a pain in the ass. I fucking oh, I, hate I, it I, by the way. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't, I simply could not. Uh, but the I have best thing people- about the best thing about being married is <laughs> I don't shave as much as I used to. <laughs> Ass, he's he's, he's stuck it. there. What's he gonna he's do? not going anywhere. We had a baby. He's not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm like, you got, you got more to worry about. Honestly, this morning, no joke. I was in the shower. I was like, am I gonna shave my legs today? And I was like, nah, <laughs> nah. I need to, but nah. nah. Well, I I always, I figure. Totally fine if, you know, if hair is not your thing. But if you're looking at a naked woman and the first thing that you notice is like, ew, pussy hair, that feels like a personal problem. Mm. You know, like if if you're looking at a beautiful naked woman and you're like turned off by hair that has grown on women's bodies for all of eternity and time, then that feels like a personal problem, frankly. Sounds like a you problem. Yeah. It, yeah. You don't have to buy my porn, but... Like you don't have to have an, have anything to say about it, <laughs> right? So tell me a little bit about um, maybe some of your top like requests or maybe most interesting requests from fans because I know that being a cam girl and having an OnlyFans, having that direct connection with fans, every girl I talk to has always got like some really interesting kinks that people are into. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, especially with Night Flirt. Uh, because, you know, it is really personal and I think people go on there because, you know, they feel like they don't really have anyone to talk to about it or they feel a little weird maybe looking it up or they want someone to engage with them with it that maybe they don't want to ask their wife or however, whatever reason there is. Uh, I get, I get a lot of cucks 
a lot of cuckolds and that is like my primary for some reason I, I couldn't tell you why that's my primary uh audience is cuckolds and can you um, explain to people who might not know because sometimes we get uh new listeners and who aren't familiar with the language can you explain what cuckolding is yeah uh cuckolding has you know different people are into different aspects of it but essentially it's the idea that another man is going to fuck your wife or your girlfriend or the object of your desire essentially and for um some men that involves you know small penis humiliation that involves um there's there can be like weird racial elements to it honestly mm, that are yeah a, a lot of cuckolding stuff that i see is is like bbc cuckolding with a white man and a black man having sex with his wife and yeah you see a lot of that and like it's like dream cuckolding i guess i don't know what it's you call like it. almost like horseshoe theory where it's almost like getting back to like it's like a version of white supremacy that is so like weird and ingrained that it almost becomes like black supremacy where the, like the idea for most of these men that I've interacted with that have that racial element to it, they're like black men are superior to white men. And obviously that's based in like weird neo-Nazi shit, but it's yeah, so it's like, like, like circular. Like it inverted, seems like you really, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I couldn't know, but there's more interesting stuff with that. Like I think that, this personal theory from a personal experience talking to dozens and dozens of people is I really feel like cuckoldry for some people is kind of a gateway into allowing themselves to explore their attraction to men or masculinity. Mm. I find that a lot of cuckolds that I talk to really want, it's almost like they're into the idea of being with a man, but kind of being like forced into it a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. Like a lot of them talk about wanting to, um, the term that people use is bull, uh, wanting to suck the bull's uh, dick after he comes like in your wife or wanting to lick the cum out of your wife's pussy or uh, wanting, a lot of them stop at wanting stuff in their ass. I find that most of them don't want something in their ass, which is where I think that, um, not confusion, but I think that hesitancy where it's like, and that's where I think that having really, you know, specific language to talk about your attraction and the way that you experience your attraction to others is really important because I think a lot of these men have some kind of vague attraction to men or to, you know, to dicks or to masculinity, and they don't really know how to express it or explore it. And I think cuckoldry is kind of a way to almost safely explore that. That's so interesting. And, you know, I never thought about it that way, but that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, when you first mentioned that, it kind of made me think of, you know, what we call like the ravishment fantasies with women, like women who have fantasies about being, you know, taken against their will and like a CNC scenario, consent, non-consent scenario, or consensual non-consent. Um, and I had a... I, I talked to Christopher Ryan on this podcast. This was actually one of my first interviews. And he talked about, you know, we talked about the, the, the ravishment fantasy and he talked about the idea that, you know, a lot of women feel like they can't be overtly sexual creatures. They can't want sex. They can't desire sex because it's like not proper, you know, women are not supposed yeah. to be that way. And so this ravishment fantasy kind of comes into play because it's the idea of like, oh, well, I was taken against my will and like, I didn't want to have this, but then I had this experience and then I ended up enjoying it, even though like initially I didn't want to because I'm like the good virgin or, you know, I'm the good girl. So, so it's interesting how like this, this denial that human beings um, force upon themselves, you know, in terms of like sexual fluidity or, you know, what it means to be a good girl or whatever, then kind of comes out in these interesting ways in sex. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. I, th I think, uh, you know, obviously there's, you know, everybody's different, of course, but I think uh, a lot of people have a really hard time expressing and figuring out exactly what it is that they're into and what they're attracted to. I think there's a lot of, you know, 
shame and it's confusing. And, you know, if you kind of stumble into something or a particular fetish or kink and maybe it kind of freaks you out a little bit, you know, like if you're, you know, into consensual non-consent, I'm sure for some people it's probably a little confusing, you know, because you don't actually want to have, you know, an act of sexual violence committed against you. But at the same time, there's just something in your monkey brain that Mm. just you can't explain but just wants that and i think that that's i think probably scary for some people but it's really hard to parse that out and that i think i think for me what's kind of a gift of asexuality is that it's never muddied by the person that i'm doing it with you know i never wonder am i into this because i like this person or am i into this because i like the way this this is or the way this feels or the way that it makes my monkey brain feel i i purely experience the you know, like the kinks and the the interests and the, uh, you know, specific ways that I like sex or that I like the human body um, without almost like the cloud of attraction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you kind of feel like it's almost easier to deliver um, what your customers are after because yeah. you're kind of removed from it in a way. Yeah, just like we you know said with other sex workers, it's not about when you know if you're you know a phone sex worker or if you're doing a shoot or you know you're a full service sex worker, it's not about how, you know how much you're really into the person. It's mm-hmm. about providing a fantasy and providing a service and creating something that for other people to consume. It's up to you. Yeah, you know, I, you know, you just got me kind of thinking about like other service industry jobs like when you work as a waiter or a cook in a restaurant you're not like necessarily doing it because like i guess if you're a cook you probably love to cook but mm. you know you yeah maybe some maybe of, you don't, some of them but so, there's a lot I've of never been, cooks out there working for true. nine bucks an hour at ihop that's true that's true okay so that's true so so yeah but that's what i mean like as a service worker like, or a masseuse or something, you know, yeah. you don't probably necessarily always are like super excited about massaging this person, you know, like the, the, the idea that people have around sex work is that like both ends have to be really into it and they have to enjoy it. Otherwise it's like soul crushing work, you know, like if you're a sex worker, a full service sex worker, who's having sex with somebody who you're not necessarily attracted to and into, that must be like a soul crushing endeavor. But could we step back yeah. and look at it from the way that you just said, it's like, I'm providing a service for somebody and you know, this is my job and I get paid for it. And that person is walking away happy. Like, couldn't that be enough for me? Like, you know what I mean? Like we, we do, it's yeah. funny about sexuality. Yeah. And you know, for, I'm really, I'm really lucky. I don't do anything that I don't want to do. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I'm in full control of my content. I've, you know, as I said, I haven't had sex with any camera, just, just not yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day, but, uh, that for me is really lucky that, you know, obviously everything on the internet is forever. And I'm sure there'll be, there's, I'm sure there's still frames of me that aren't very flattering, but at the same time, you know, that's a, that's a genie in the bottle that I let out. And I accepted that when I started to do this, that's what I'm going to do. And I came into it with the idea of like, like business really. Like I was like, I'm going to make, you know, make my living and make my money and do this in a specific way and in a way that benefits me and doesn't compromise what I want to do. Cause I was really lucky to have that option. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so funny. All these things that you're saying are make, making me think about like other things and like personal experiences that kind of relate and not to like turn this into saying about me, but I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm interested. Um, <laughs> so I started an OnlyFans a couple of years ago um, and I started modeling nude, which I hadn't done my entire career. I've been in the industry for 22 years. Right. Wow. And I've been, a, wow. I've been a director, a pr- photographer for 22 years. And so when I finally started doing nude modeling, it was like quite a surprise to everybody, including myself. Um, like, <laughs> but, but I only do it, you know, for my only fans, like nobody else shoots me for any other brands. Like most of the time my husband shoots me or I just use a tripod. Um, so clicker. yeah, actually I use the self clicker. timer. Because I don't want to have no. a thing in my hand. No, I you need a clicker. Timer. No, because then I got to hide my it hand. It changed my to... life. 
I say I, if I had two things, I would have my phone and a clicker. I can make a tripod out of sticks. And the clicker is worth the five dollar investment. I'm telling it's you. A, it's like survival, you know, like they drop you in the middle of the forest and like what two things do you have to survive? Is a clicker and a phone and I can live I can I can make my money and like get myself out of there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But what I was gonna say is that I have so many people you know, that write into me and say like, oh, what's it like to like now be in front of the camera and, um, to know that like men are like masturbating to you or like, you know, does it turn you on? Like, like they want to hear me talk about like how this is, you know, changed, changed my like sex life. And I'm like, so like in, when I take these pictures, I'm like, oh, people are going to like masturbate to my tits. Oh my God, this is great. But I don't think about that at all. I think about like, it is a business endeavor just like you do. And I'm like, you know, I don't even love being in front of the camera. I don't dislike it, but my favorite thing is being behind the camera. I much prefer that. But I actually, I really only do the OnlyFans so I can make enough money so I can produce shoots where I shoot other people naked. That's literally why I do it. (laughs) So I can shoot other people. I shoot myself (laughs) naked so I can make money so I can shoot other people naked because that's my interest. Um, But yeah, for me, it's really like, and it's been a great experience for many other ways. And I've actually talked about this. um, um, If you go to my YouTube channel, I have a couple of videos talking about like how modeling nude has kind of helped like change my confidence level and, you know, has made me feel like better about my postpartum body and that kind of thing. So it's been like actually a wonderful thing in that way. But, but yeah, like same kind of things, what you're saying, like for me, it's really like a business endeavor, you know, I'm not necessarily doing it because I'm like so turned on by the idea of other people looking at me naked. Exactly. Yeah. And I look, I love what I do. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sign on to talk to people on the phone if I didn't want to do it. Um, you know, but at the same time, yeah, like it, it, if I didn't make good money doing it, I wouldn't do it. You know, like if, if the payoff wasn't worth what I put into it and you know, the, the consequences, frankly, then I, wouldn't do it you know I would do something else I it could, it could be any other thing sex work just happens to be what I do but I would probably put this level of you know time and attention and care into what I'm doing into any other thing it just happens to be this yeah and that also like you know another question that a lot of sex workers get like oh well would you do this if like you know you had to do it for free like nobody would do any job if they had to do it for free like like we live in a capitalistic world where we have to pay our fucking bills like would i talk to strangers on the phone about their dicks for free no sadly i was having sex with people for free so that was a mistake but <laughs> <laughs> that was my real mistake but uh <laughs> but no i would not do uh my modeling or my phones or my cams for free no that's the whole. So let's point. talk about let's talk about the phone sex thing because you've yeah. like kind of casually mentioned that you you do that, and I know that you're doing a lot of that more lately. Um, and before we started, you were telling me that you've got quite a few guys who have a, is it a sneezing fetish. Is that what you said? Yep. Yeah, I've had at least three separate people request sneezing. Interesting. And did they explain to you why they were into this? I did have one guy explain to me, and it did make sense. I will say this this is probably the best explanation you're probably ever going to get for someone who's into sneezing. But he said that he used to have a girlfriend that had like seasonal allergies and they would have sex and she would sneeze when they were having sex and her pussy would get really tight. And, and in like every so often on Twitter, this goes around where it's like, you should cough while you're, while your man's in you because it's going to feel really good. And so I think he, he got like Pavlov trained that the sneeze felt really good on his dick wow and that is like that makes sense I can totally get A to B from that so that one it makes sense the other two I don't think have explained to me usually they kind of tend to go along with like um like burping and farting fetishes as well so it kind of Mm. is like you you get a what it tends in my experience has been that if there's one fetish somebody's into there kind of tends to be a circle uh sort of Venn diagram of things that are likely also into. So if someone Mm. approaches you being really submissive, you know, there might be a chance based on at least my clientele that they might be into like being submissive, which could lead into humiliation, which could lead into small penis humiliation, which uh, could lead into being sissified, uh, which is 
when you basically it's like getting off and being emasculated so like the maid outfit uh, kind of things you see on fem- uh, Fendon. Mm. Oh, sissified, like being like dr- ma- being forced to dress like a sissy. Yeah, b- yeah, made right. to dress up like like a girl and emasculate right. yourself essentially. Right, 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 right. It's, it's a, right. yeah. That's yeah. That's uh, so interesting. You know, I had, I wonder if too, if the phone sex um, stuff, people feel a little bit more open to indulge in like fantasies that they maybe have a little bit of shame around because you can't see them and they're just talking to you on the phone was it i guess on cam they can't see you either but you can see them and i think that and if they're looking at the camera a lot it does get a little parasocial oh you can see them but they can no like a like if no what i mean is like like if your viewer is watching you and you're direct interacting with them pretty directly it feels more personal Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because like there's other people kind of watching you interact with them, right? But yeah, but I totally agree with thinking that people. De- I think people definitely call because there's a little bit of shame around mm. what they do. I, my in my experience, it's a lot of like older men, uh, people who seem to be married or in long term relationships, or are like on the road or have like a lifestyle that doesn't allow them to have a relationship or a fulfilling sex life, and mm-hmm. so. I think a lot of people, they, they like talking to a real person, you know, Mm -hmm. some people totally fine to have your five minute heavy breathing call. Totally fine by me. Those are super fine. But sometimes you have people that just want to talk and want to have someone to listen to and want to, they want to call again and they want you to remember things about them. Uh, So it's kind of a whole series, but I, I do think that it seems to be that on phone sex sites like Night Flirt, submissive men are very 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 popular there's a lot of doms that do really well it seems to be a lot of men that are more submissive do you have regulars who call you and do you end up like just chatting and like never getting to anything sexual at all yeah oh yeah i have uh, i have people like that i have people that have called for an hour um just to talk uh one guy was telling me all about how he was he loved the movie cleopatra from like the 60s to the 70s and he ha- he went every day over the summer to the point that he would just let him in for free and he was just like obsessed with Cleopatra the Cleopatra as a as a figure but as the movie it was great he bought the 10 hour version of it when it came out in 2000 for like $10,000 and he's never watched it he's waiting for the special day which I don't blame him I would I would wait for the special day too wait what's the special day what's the special day I be? don't I don't I think it's just like when he feels like it's right, you know, when the universe feels like it's the perfect day to finally watch the nine or 10 hour cut of Cleopatra that was Man, lost better, to time. He better jump on that. Cause you know, life is short and you fucking never He's know. Getting older. He's a little <laughs> bit older. He's got a grown son. I know people just tell you all sorts of stuff cause they don't have anyone to tell otherwise. And I, I feel like I can generally hold a pretty good conversation. So I find that people really open up to me pretty easily and that, if people want to talk, I feel like I can generally be a pretty good listening ear and just let them get it out and let them kind of explore what exactly they're trying to get out with it. Right. Yeah. I've, I've talked to a lot of sex workers who say that they kind of feel more like a therapist than a sex worker that a lot of, a lot of times people just want someone to connect with, you know, yeah, like a companion. I feel like yeah. I'm more of a companion. Yeah. Well, Ellie, thank you so much for coming on. This was super interesting. Thank you so um, much for having me. Yeah, no, it was great. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Go ahead Absolutely. and plug all your links. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I am Ellie, E-L-L-I-E, next door, Ellie Next Door, like your neighbor, one. And uh, I have my website, elliennextdoor.com, which is still a work in progress, but everywhere is next door. So I'm on Reddit and Twitter, on Chatterbait, on OnlyFans. Uh, I post a full-length uh, solo masturbation video every single day on my OnlyFans from 5 to 35 minutes generally, and they're great. So I highly recommend that you uh, go and check them out. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Instagram and Twitter, on Instagram and Twitter, at Holly Randall. And, of course, to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Unfiltered. Ellie, thank you again for your time. Thank you. And we will see you guys next week.
Since I've started working with Manscaped, they've really expanded on their product line. It's incredible. And if you get their perfect package, you will not only get ball toner and ball deodorant, but you will also get, of course, the electric trimmer, a shed travel bag, and their boxer briefs, which are the most comfortable boxer briefs. You can get all of this for 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU.